I'd like to welcome everyone who's watching this Charleston Literary Festival event featuring the revered author Margaret Atwood and her interlocutor Regina Marler. A special shout out to Margaret Talcott and everyone joining us from the American Ancestors American Inspiration author series and the Charleston County Public Library as well as to our very much appreciated sponsors of this session, TNT. Margaret Atwood, an internationally renowned writer and public intellectual, is the author of more than 50 works of fiction, poetry and essays. Her 1985 classic, The Handmaiden's Tale, was followed in 2019 by a sequel, The Testaments. Both novels, resonated and continue to resonate with the temper of the times, have been reimagined on stage and, sc and screen and stimulate social and political conversations across the globe. Her current book, Old Babes in the Wood, a poignant collection of short fiction suffused with her trademark wit, was published after the death of her long-standing partner, Graham Gibson and includes a sequence of stories, a poignant sequence of stories, about a long married couple and their lives together, as one of them contemplates a future alone. Margaret Atwood will be in conversation with Regina Marler, literary critic, author of Bloomsbury Pie, and editor of the selected letters of Vanessa Bell, the artist sister of Virginia Woolf. It's my pleasure to hand over to Regina Mar Marler, and Margaret Atwood. Thank you. And, and welcome, Margaret. Thank you for joining us at the festival. My pleasure. A couple weeks ago, you wrote in your Substack newsletter about being in death's gazebo, quite far from the main entrance, <laughs> and you've since had a pacemaker installed. I, I hope you're no longer even in death's neighborhood. Uh, how are you feeling? Well, that's why you get the pacemaker. <laughs> So you don't suddenly die. Uh, well, as anybody who's had one of these will tell you, it, it controls part of the problem, but not all of it. Mm. Um, so it keeps you from actually, it keeps your heart from actually stopping. That's uh, the, the mm. aim. And it keeps you from um, um, having blood puddle around long enough to get clots in it, which will then give you a stroke. So... That's the aim, and that part is working just fine. Um, but then there's the medication part, and we're we're tweaking that, uh, tweaking okay. it. I see so the medical term used. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the same newsletter, you uh, you talked about the you know, two or three events that you would have to miss that week, and and something else you would have to do by Zoom, and. Um, sure. Uh, you you really you're a marvel. You're publishing about a book a year. I um I also read that it's you you think the count for essays is about forty a year, which is incredible. And I'm wondering is is it family trait? Uh, where you where you this indefatigable energy? Were your parents like this? Yes, uh, but but they weren't writers, but they were very energetic. Mm. So given their background. So my dad grew up in a very rural environment, very rural. So in the early part of the 20th century, and we're talking before electricity and so on and so forth, and um, they were both very keen on um, self-reliance. So making your own way, they, they, they um, I won't say they were workaholics, but they were always busy. They were quite busy. Mm. So you spent... And they were not averse to child labor. We were enrolled in this <laughs> <laughs> busyness of theirs um, because, of course, they'd both grown up that way. So they they just, you know, it was what you did. So we we had uh, chores and we were, we were put to work doing this and that. And um, it gives you a lot of practical skills. Yes. And you were about... Uh, maybe I maybe my my math is wrong, but you were about half the year really in the in the forest with your with your with yeah, your the only part of my childhood. This did not continue on through high school, right? Um, 
but in the early part, I would say it was more than half. Mm. So April to November, uh, essentially from when the ice broke up, and we're talking, we're talking northern regions here. Uh, the ice would break up in April. Mm. Imagine that. Imagine that, Charlestonians. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, in in November, it would start to freeze again and get pretty howly up there. But my mm -hmm. father was a forest entomologist by that time. Insects do nothing in the winter. Just <laughs> letting you know that. In northern regions, they don't. I don't know what they do in Charleston. They probably just continue on. Uh, but in in the winter, they typically hibernate or die. And uh, so he would then go into a city and write up his research that he had done. And then this was your opportunity to uh, to go to school and... Uh... No, not yet. Yeah, later. Um, no, a, li a little bit later. We, we didn't have any preschool or kindergarten at that time. And particularly not during the war, wasn't any kindergarten. Mm. Um, so at one point I was sent off instead to learn tap dancing <laughs> with Miss Pickering. <laughs> Miss Pickering. <laughs> Miss Pickering had a tap dance in ballet school and the um, ballet part was, uh, we each had a partner and we, and we were halves of a windmill <laughs> in little Dutch costume. So you went like this, your partner did the opposite. Uh, very interpretive and the tap dancing part we had little sailor suits and we tap danced on tops of on the tops of large round wooden cheese boxes that had been de decorated to look like drums <laughs> I I repeat this was the war so it was quite military so the uh the the, the Dutch the Dutch girl costume did it have the uh did it have the hat on it similar yes, to the handmaid's tail that. Had absolutely that, um, for sure. And um, there was a special sort of Canadian Holland thing going on at that time because the uh, royal family of Holland spent the war years in Canada. Oh. Ooh. Good. And if you go to Ottawa in the spring, you will see acres and acres and acres of, of tulips. And those are gifts from Holland. Ah. If you go to Holland, even to this very day, you will you will find a lot. And if you say you're Canadian, there's a, an immediate welcome. We used to go quite a bit because Graham's father was a, a general in the Canadian army, and Holland was the thing that they were supposed to be specially liberating. Mm -hmm. So this this time that you spent in the forest, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it, it it it's contributed to your feeling for nature and to your conservation ethos but but it seems as if it's all it's also been a part of what set you apart as a child when you did go to school that you had this this other life well i went to a bunch of schools because mm -hmm. uh, we moved around and um i didn't go to as many schools as as graham did being a child of the military mm -hmm. i think he went to 15 yeah, he said in every single one of them, you had to have a fight with the school bully as soon as you arrived. I'm a military brat. I should have. I if only I'd, I'd, I'd heard that uh, earlier. And that was the way that was the way yeah, to make that was definitely the way. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, you know, I suppose it did because I didn't I wasn't spending a full year in school, but um, our mother would just get hold of in those days. It was workbooks. You know, mm -hmm. these workbooks. A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 C. So I'm I'm sorry to say that I learned to fill out the workbooks pretty quickly because once you'd done that, you could go out and do other things if you were in the forest. However, if you were in school, you couldn't. So it was a disadvantage when you were in actual school because you were finished and then you just had to sit around like that. Well, when you when you um, 
you started to write, uh, obviously a few a few childhood works, um, but when you started to write, you were a poet and you were also a Victorianist. And uh, what, what drew you to the Victorians? Well, this, you've condensed quite a long time period. I have, I have. Into one <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Yeah, I started to write in high school when I was 16, but I didn't become a victorious until I was 21. Mm. Um, so time had passed. Mm. Uh, what drew me to the Victorians? I had quite, um, I was in a course called Honors English at the University of Toronto, and that took you from Anglo-Saxon to T.S. Eliot, basically, with mm. in a fairly intense way in, in four years. I, I don't think they would dare to have a course like that today because people would complain that they had to read too much. Um, but we did the Victorian novel in one section, we did Victorian poetry in another one, and we did Victorian thought in yet a third. So pretty heavy on the Victorians, yeah. which weren't fashionable in graduate schools at that time. Mm. What was fashionable was uh, metaphysical poetry. So John Donne was the thing, but but not Tennyson. However, I had such good teachers that I I took quite a, um, I took quite a fancy to them. Mm. And um, when I went off to graduate school, I I went to a graduate school where there was one of the few specialists in Victorian literature who happened to be a Canadian. Um, so I went off basically to study with him. And a very thorough time I had of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes um, they did nothing about telling you about the clothing. They should have done that. Oh yes, no. yes. You have a special interest in clothing. It's it's well, it's even I think it's determined, everywhere. It determined in those days how how people how people's bodies found themselves in the world. Um, and when you go into the history of costume, you realize that these things all had substructures. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you were given a certain body shape by these underpinnings, which, of course, were quite hard to see, hard to get information on them, because mostly you just saw paintings or fashion plates. You didn't get to see the corsets. Uh, but for those who were interested, there's an excellent um, YouTube series called Prior Attire. Prior Attire. She is an historical costume recreator, and she shows you how people got dressed in the morning. <laughs> so important. Anyway, why is this pertinent at all? Because when I was writing a book called um, Alias Grace, the hardest things to research were the underpinnings. I wish that prior attire had been available to me then, mm. as it is now. Mm. The clothing ends up being incredibly, incredibly important in the novel, and and also textiles in general, um, the quilts, of course, that are in you know. Alias Grace. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, things were a lot more expensive then, relatively speaking, than they are now. Mm. Um, so people, people kept any little scraps that came their way mm. um, because you couldn't just go out and get cheap ones. Um, yes, my grandmother was a quilt maker, oh. as people were, not not because they liked it, but because you didn't throw things out. <laughs> Do you have them? Do you have your grandmother's quilts? Well, they're, they're too old. I have some old quilts, but not hers. Mm. Let's see. Well, I want to talk about your 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 beautiful new story collection, Old Babes in the Woods. And these are, as as Diana said, these are stories that are mostly written in and a, in and after, I think around and after the death of your partner um, in September 2019. And um, well, there's there's so, two sections. There's uh, actually three sections. The, in the first section, everybody's still alive. The middle section are unrelated stories, some of them quite weird. Um, <laughs> well, those, if you like. And then the final section is the one that you're talking about. Well, the uh, 
I, I think it's a it's it's interesting. It's actually a really dark title <laughs> because it is. <laughs> so Those not... who know the history of that folk ballad. Exactly. You know that the title comes from a folk ballad about these two little children who get lost in the wood and then and then die. <laughs> Something that Charles Dickens, of course, was drawing upon in the old curiosity shop when he has little Nell dying in this very old this very um babes in the woods uh kind of way and um, you have uh, adopted the name adopted the name for uh for uh, your your main character nell in the yes, couple well it's a bit slangy uh <laughs> because babes can mean either babies or it can mean babes <laughs> but that's what makes it an outward title <laughs> because oh, it, you mean a, a bit slangy <laughs> it, it straddles the line between yeah. You know the 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 old the the old folklore with you know the bloody folklore and and the humor of uh, of the present moment. So it's very a fine, a fine line. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I'm I'm really stuck into the French Revolution. Ah, mm. oh, talk about bloody, yes. Talk about yes, mm. yes. Things got dark pretty quickly. Yes, you you've you've said that you you think of it as the and it is I, as I I see it as well as the model for for all the uh, subsequent revolutions for the modern ones the the American Revolution is a is an anomaly mm. the other other revolutions did not follow that pattern mm. but they sure followed the French Revolution yes <laughs> yes we're all gritting our teeth see what's happening um, oh, boy current situations. Um, so this this section of of stories that's that's autobiographical. It's it seems to track fairly closely with life from from what one could tell, or it seems reasonable to track closely with life. It seems lightly fictionalized, and I wonder why you chose this short story as opposed to the memoir for for some of this material. Because there's too much of it. <laughs> okay, so if I had tried to uh, anyway. Um, short stories are always pretty edited life. Yes, uh, you just you're you're you, you're not putting everything in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I am working away at at something that is less fictional. Although you should never trust a memoir either. <laughs> the, well, it's the all trouble, shape. The trouble yeah. with you know life is it's it's very big. There's just a lot of stuff. Yes. So anything you write about it is going to have to leave out something. Mm. And um, people writing autobiographies or memoirs, they're they're always deciding what to put in and what to leave out. Somebody tried to do a, an anthology of literary anecdotes in this country, and, and they were unable to get it off the ground because too many people were still alive. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't want to. They didn't want to rat out their friends. <laughs> no, no. You can only tell those stories at dinner to somebody else. You can't uh, can't publish them. Yeah. Well, in these days, they're likely to turn up on social media, even if you tell them at dinner. Oh, that's um, true. But they're often pretty funny, but em embarrassing to the ones that they are about. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a a great anthology called Mortification: Writers and Their Public Shame in which people, including myself, tell about really embarrassing, awful things that have happened to them in public, such as at literary festivals. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh yes. <laughs> uh, oh, that's quite, quite worth a read. Oh. Because it's telling on yourself, it's, it's not in the same category as, you know, telling, telling tales out of school about other people. No, no. Well, it's it's always our, our aim at the festival to avoid such incidents. <laughs> but... Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> we don't They're memorable. <laughs> <laughs> no anthologies, no anthologies for us. So there is a story called The Dusty Lunch, which yes. is, is fascinating for, for anyone who has had a, a, a death in their family and had to sort the... the uh, you know, the miscellaneous papers and 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 things, uh, all the memorabilia that that comes to us, and and that is so um, you know it's suffused with emotion often. And um, it describes your narrator uh, going through letters 
and poems that that were left by her father-in-law um and and the narrator discovers a letter from martha gellhorn in it which <laughs> drawn from life as i assume how how did that it is feel? it is life <laughs> it must have felt incredible well i even had to include the typos <laughs> no you know arm wrestle with my editor yes. that's what's in the letter you can't change it <laughs> uh, yeah she was she was quite a figure martha gellhorn she there and i heard of, in the course of researching this I heard a lot of stories about her that are quite incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a very determined person and um, got herself to the D-Day landing by hook or by crook. And in fact, it was more or less by crook. She she locked herself in the bathroom of a Red Cross ship. Mm -hmm. She didn't have credentials at that point, but she got there and she, mm -hmm. she got her story. And what you what you do is you um, you track your. It's actually at this point it, it feels like um, almost like a, a Janet Malcolm essay. You're 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 moving through the mind of the of the uh, narrative is trying to solve this mystery, figure figure out what when when could they have met? What did it mean, perhaps for the for the? Well, we know when they met. We know when Mel Martha Gellhorn met the jolly old brigadier. Uh, that's well documented. the The mystery is these uh, poems that he didn't burn. You mm -hmm. know, if you don't want your descendants going through and asking questions like this, burn everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he 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 saved them, and um, we never did figure out who they were about. We we mm -hmm. have a suspicion they're they're love poems. Um, not of the kind that would go with a wife, mm. for instance. Mm. But what was going on? I I don't think it was Martha. Mm. I do not think so, um, because things were too noisy and dusty at the time that they <laughs> at the time that they met. Mm. She was covering um, Monte Cassino. All right. What a thing to have to cover! Yeah, incredible. Oh, but it's 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 an, it's a wonderful story, and I I also love a story called Two Scorched Men," which uh, looks to be the story of of a, a friendship with uh, some French friends. But it's also it's also about writing, and it's about um, entrusting your stories to someone. Here's a a, a brief quote. Um, about this, about these two men, both of them presented me with their stories that year. Since they knew what sort of creature I was, they also knew, indeed they trusted, that I would someday relate their lives for them. And it's so beautiful that they do this, and you do this, to extend their memory. Yeah, well, it's that's all pretty true. Mm. Uh, one of them was an Irishman, um, you were keen on having lots of Irish um, writers at your festival, and you can see that this Irishman follows true to swore, true to true to form. He's, he was a great swearer <laughs> and, and inventor of, <laughs> um, you know, language agglomerations, shall we say? Uh, yes, and the other one was a quite ironic. Frenchman who had been uh, a teenage person in the French resistance and had got caught, but had managed to make it over into Spain where he was put in a, um, what would you call it, an internment camp. Um, and I heard quite a lot about that, including the fact that they had, they had, they had an awful lot of sardines. <laughs> so that when I said to him, uh, there's some good sardines in at the market. He said, oh, I cannot look a sardine in the face. <laughs> <laughs> well, he may, he may have felt, uh, you know, like, like he was starving, but we now know how incredibly healthy his sardine diet was. <laughs> well, I suppose, yeah, they weren't just eating them. They were making little lamps out of them and <laughs> everything. But then he got traded. The British traded him. Mm. Um, and he said, they traded me for a sack of flour, he said. But it was a very big sack. <laughs> oh, I uh, 
I think what's what's really useful, and I, I say this for for our audience here, it's really wonderful to read this collection at the same time as your most recent uh, poetry collection, Dearly, which is published in 2020, and to um, look at the different the different aspects of um, of your experience in the poem Salt, for example. It, I think it captures one of the essential questions of, about grieving. You know, is it, is it um, more painful or more comforting to, to remember um, happy times in, in yes. the past? That's a very Victorian sentiment. <laughs> in fact, it's a very Tennysonian sentiment. Sorrow's crown of sorrow is remembering happier times. Wow. Oh. Practically word for word, Regina. Mm. Uh, yeah, so so if you haven't liked the person, then you have quite an easy time after they die because you're, you're rather pleased that they're dead. <laughs> so which would you rather have? You know, somebody that you didn't like in real life and have to go through not liking them and their bad behavior, whatever the reasons were that you didn't like them for, uh, or somebody that you really did like a lot, and then they're gone. Yes, yes, it's true. It's your choice. <laughs> you you've said that you feel poetry may may come at least for you. It feels like it comes from a different part of the brain, without a poetry. doubt. Yes. So when you it have does it for everybody, how does it how does it feel for you when you have a uh, an impulse, you have a, a, a character comes to mind or an image or a phrase. How do you know, uh, oh, that's a that's a poem? Uh, um, because of the form that it comes in. Mm. Okay, so let us let us make a, an inaccurate analogy. <laughs> you you can think of these these forms, larger, shorter, and very short, as as wavelengths. Mm. So a novel, the wavelengths are quite long. So you might introduce a motif on page um, 72, you repeat it again on page 165, and you pay it off on page uh, 396. Mm. So the it's like a tsunami. When you're out at sea, you don't notice it because the wavelength is so long. Short stories are closer together. <laughs> it's more like this. Lyric poetry, and that is only one kind of poetry, by the way. Um, the, the wavelengths are very close together. So it's much more condensed. Um, so instead of, because all all art is repetition with variations. Mm -hmm. um, instead of finding something that you're connecting on page 62 with page 197, mm -hmm. it's a syllable. Mm -hmm. A syllable in this line is connected with a syllable on that line. So you're, pay you're paying a lot of attention or the form pays attention for you to very condensed waves. Mm -hmm. Let's call them energy waves. I see. I see. So it announces it announces itself at first as its um, suddenness or its its expansiveness. Well, so all of these things are made of words, right? Novels, stories, and poems are all their their primary substance is words. People say images, et cetera, et cetera, but really it's words. Um, so you you find yourself contemplating a certain set of words like that. Thanks. What form are these words coming in? Mm. Or we could use a dressmaking analogy. We could say, <laughs> you've got this much material, but you don't have enough. For a ball gown. Yes. <laughs> you only have enough for an apron, <laughs> something that your mother will be delighted to receive at Christmas. <laughs> yes. Uh, I um I noticed something when I was reading your your first published novel, 
the edible woman. Um, and this is uh, published in 1969. And um, a lot of people have talked about the um, anorexia. Uh, no, but I didn't know about it at that point. Exactly. I actually wrote this book in, in 1964 or 5. Yes. And the publisher lost it. He was actually on his floor. He told me the most outrageous lie, which was um, he said that a pregnant woman had been in charge of it. And you know what that does to their minds. Oh. And she'd put it in a drawer and yeah. forgotten about it, which was just a fib. Yeah. I, I have eyes in the skies. I, <laughs> I have I have my spies. They they said no, it wasn't in a drawer. There was no pregnant woman. It was on his floor, and he put something else on top of it. Anyway, I was very fond of him, but it meant that when it it actually came out, time had passed, um, and it coincided with it coincided with second wave women's movement. But it actually had been written um five years before mm. so sort of a, a, a proto-feminist you've said yeah who knew anything about feminism at, at that point except for betty friedan and um simone mm. de beauvoir they mm. were both around but you were thinking about some really interesting um ideas around uh uh, well, women's roles, uh, obviously, but also specifically about unconventional reproduction, because your uh, your protagonist, Marianne, has a, a roommate, Ainsley, who decides that, you know, the, she says the, the problem with the, the family is, uh, you know, with the family unit is, is husbands. And uh, <laughs> I want to I want to have you know, that this is a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it is very funny. And she decides um, to do some quite scandalous at the time, quite radical idea. She's going to uh, have a child on her own yeah. and um, she's not going to uh, look around. She's going to look around for good genetic material in the uh, <laughs> the the father, but she's not going to tell him. Doesn't seem very too far-fetched these days. <laughs> no, no, it seems, aside from the consent issue, because, yeah. you know, he's he's consenting to the to the sex, but he has no idea what her plans are. <laughs> Or, there you go pretty, yes pretty funny oh uh, it can have it can happen um yes yeah, so it, it's an anti-comedy and that the wrong people get married <laughs> yes <laughs> well I, I i wanted also to talk about um about your obviously your emphasis on on the environment um and about uh, green protocols in in 2006, uh, you wrote about how you'd you'd already started trying to establish green protocols in your home and in your your life, and you were some somewhat a, a pioneer in this really you know, low energy car and all this oh, yeah. kind of thing. Um, getting a little solar, not using your your air conditioning, and that you also talked about how difficult it was to practice conscious green living alone because the government wasn't really talking about it people these ideas hadn't hadn't spread you know through the population yet and now they've they've changed um a little bit do you, do you, are you be hopeful do you feel a little less alone in your uh in your efforts well i think i, I think we all have seen the um the fires and the floods and the hurricanes and uh other examples of extreme weather yes um so this is this has moved as an issue. It's moved from the back burner to the forefront. It's something that cannot be ignored anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we did do a program last fall called Practical Utopias. Yes, we united two hundred active participants from around the world and 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 got them uh, to design. Um, a carbon neutral or carbon negative way of living, the material world. They, they had to think about housing, they had to think about clothing, food, um, energy, corpse disposal, uh, <laughs> not to be ignored. Uh, you know, all of these, these things that we all deal with in our lives every single day. Were there different ways of doing them and we wanted them to do the cost benefit uh, where are you going to get the materials? How far will they have to travel? Um, and, th and they did pretty well. We had eight groups working away at it, and and 
And then they presented their utopias at the end for the rest of us to see. They also had to tell us how these things were going to be governed. What were they going to do about education? What about um, health care? What about old people? What about who makes the decisions? And they, they were good on everything, except they were they were a bit hesitant to deal with two things. Number one, what about a police force? <laughs> what are you going to do if somebody doesn't agree with you? Mm. What are you going to do if somebody's cheating, mm. like hoarding or stealing these things? What What is your answer to that? Well, we surely nobody would do that. <laughs> Wrong. They would. Um, and the second one was money. What are you going to do about money? Oh, so there was quite a lot of bartering going on and exchanges, and people were quite keen on um, using already used clothing. But mm. but you can do that up to a for a while, and then even the reused clothing is going to give out. So you then have to think about where you might get some more, mm. and how are you going to pay for it. And are you assuming that all other communities on the planet are living the way you are? And if not, what about that that boundary between your your way and the outside world? How are you going to negotiate that? Uh, needless to say, the Victorian era was an age of utopias, both literary ones, of which there were literally thousands, and um, and real ones in which people went off usually to North America <laughs> to try to set up, you know, some ideal community living. Mm. I think my favorite is called Fruitland, and it was Louisa May Alcott's dad, the airhead transcendentalist. They got a group of people, and they acquired a farm, and they were going to live on this farm and grow fruit. <laughs> and they were also going to... And they're going to live off the fruit and also off vegetables, but only vegetables that grew upwards. Because ones that grew downwards, downwards were too earthy. Oh. Sort of, yeah, isn't it? It's great. Uh, and of course, none of them knew how to grow anything. They were not practical at all. So the upshot was that the man, the men sat around and discussed the true, the beautiful, and the good. And the women drove themselves crazy trying to figure out what they were all going to eat. <laughs> yeah, so Fruitlands, and that's that's why I and I explained Fruitlands to my participants and said, you have to be practical. If you're going to grow fruit, you need to know how to grow fruit. <laughs> it's actually, the rudiments, the basics. <laughs> it is, it is. And this actually leads, I've, I've been wondering, I've been following the, uh, the the urban homestead movement because you you as a you know when you were a, a young mother you know, you you took your your family off and lived a mm -hmm. very no, we were already living life. we we were living in the country because it was cheap yeah we're both writers it was cheap um, so I told you about child labor I had a lot of experience in in kitchen gardens mm -hmm. so it was quite easy for me to do that mm -hmm. um, and I also knew about um, canning, preserving, all of those right. techniques. Um, so I could give you a long list of the things we we made. I'll give you the worst ones. We we made sauerkraut. We should never have done that anywhere near the house. It just smells terrible. We should have done it out, out, in, the, out in the drive shed, not in the cellar. Uh, and we made all different kinds of wine most of which were quite successful, except for two kinds. The beet wine, which was very medicinal. It, it, it tasted very good for you, <laughs> but otherwise quite disgusting. And the rhubarb wine, which was really undrinkable. <laughs> I don't know what we did wrong, but it was it was just terrible. We couldn't use it at all. But the the apple, the pear, the dandelion, you have to be very careful about getting all the green parts off. Um, the hawthorn blossom; these were these were excellent. Mm. 
This about is good. The, about the beer, about the beer that exploded, I will say nothing. <laughs> you you are more better prepared than most for the the uh, the utopia of, of the future. Um, I wouldn't count on it. We still had to buy things. <laughs> well, well, I have one one more question about. Uh, it's actually, um, you know, it's about the st state of the world at this at this moment. We have, uh, you know, so many. Pressures on you're going to ask me about about being the author of a banned book. Oh yes, it's mm. true. I will ask you, what's that? What's that like being the author of a banned book? Familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's The Handmaid's Tale, which, which gets regularly banned in certain places these days, um, mm. because it's got sex in it. Uh, uh, the ostensible reason. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel I should get a big billboard and put it up saying too hot to read. <laughs> Didn't you have a, uh, a copy made that was, that was un oh, yeah, yeah, the unburnable book. Yes, we did. And they, <laughs> they had to, that wasn't me getting it made. It was me participating, um, uh, in the video of it. I was wow. given a flamethrower and, and some asbestos gloves. Uh, causing a nervous moment in the studio. As I said, Margaret, 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 just, just point it at the book. <laughs> just the book. <laughs> and now you can give that back to us now. <laughs> well, I don't think we can do better than to pause there. I, I really wish that you could, um, that you were in person and we could do audience questions because we have, we have a terrific audience in Charleston, but I, um, I very, very much appreciate you you joining us and talking about your wonderful new book. Thanks so much. And you're so welcome. And Mary Irving, if you're watching, my first roommate from North Carolina, <laughs> we're both still alive. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>